The Brandon Peters Show may contain explicit language and detailed plot points. For more information on the show, stay tuned to the end of the episode. Here's Brandon. Happy Halloween, dear listeners. It's time again for the Brandon Peters Show. I'm very excited today to discuss the 2022 film Out There Halloween Mega Tape. I'm having trouble with that title. It does not roll off the tongue. I struggled talking about it last when I was trying to present it last week. Here it is. But joining me uh, for that discussion, executive editor from the Saturday evening post. Uh, I'm tr- struggling with words. Executive editor from the Saturday Evening po- Post, Troy Brownfield. I got your name right. Hello, Brandon. Oh, we are off to a start of starts. Okay. Uh, so, Troy, you and I, we did the WNUF Halloween special, which I had a refresher episode about that with Jessica Altman last week, six years ago. Um, Man, that was six years ago. You weren't even at the Post yet. No, no, nope. you're that's you're, crazy. You're my friend that writes comic books, Troy. Yeah, executive editor. Yeah, I did do some comic stuff uh, this year that I'm not sure I can, well, I, one I can talk about, one I'm not sure if I can talk about, but I still do that. But you know, the day job is very different. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, WNUF Halloween special. Um, I had not heard of it, honestly, until you introduced me to it. Right. And um, man, I had, remember having a great time talking about that. And what a, I, I felt like it was just a real find, you know, yeah. that yeah. that was my, and, and I've shown uh, or told people about it over time, mm-hmm. but I've, you know, it, it's got a special place. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it really special place because in addition, I talked last week about how um I just I watch it every year now. It hits a nostalgic bone that's not even like horror bone, even with things. Yeah. Um that conversation we had in the episode unlocked so many doors uh and direction for our conversations and stuff we talk about and like yeah. that we carry through podcast writing, texting each other, stuff like that. Um, and I obvi- also like importantly like jessica i i said that she was brought on for that one i with that because we do this segment randomly where we'll watch commercial reels and <clears throat> talk about those for an episode yeah. um this fits with the wnuf and stuff fits with our products of the panic bit which wnuf was the genesis for that discovery of yeah people need to talk about this that was like pre q and and all sorts of like rise of the satanic panic part two the, the ghoulies two of yeah conspiracy theory sequels um but yeah so that was a, I, I believe while the episode's not that long if you find it um on my old show called cinema cavalcade um we record for like three hours that night i remember there was like a bathroom break <laughs> during it <laughs> and we went for like another hour and a half or so like yeah. we had so much to unlock there that we, it was it was crazy. Yeah. And I think that's a hallmark of like a really successful thing mm-hmm. that um, there's no way that you can watch. Well, really either one, but in particular, the first one, there's no way that you can watch that and not have to dissect it because mm-hmm. so much is going on with uh, um, put on my ex professor hat now. Uh, so much is going on with the minutia of that and that every little thing in it is an expression of the time in a different way every yes. commercial is something different the what the commercials are for like the mall and you know the tape trader and all the different things they're all different pieces of culture mm-hmm. that make up this kind of 80s patchwork that is the part of the 80s that we don't really talk about yeah it's it's uh 
everyone's familiar with the meme of um, this is what you think the eighties look like with the neon bedroom. And right. This is what it looked like with the paneling. Um, WNUF is the paneling. <laughs> yep. Exactly. <laughs> they, they understood that stuff on a really granular level, apart from the plot and the story. Mm-hmm. It's just so much to it. Right. And it, and like I talked about, so this month has kind of been focused on that, but a little bit because uh, first episode of October I did was Ty West House of the Devil, which predates Stranger Things. WNUF yeah. predates Stranger Things. And these are the thing I love about those two is they both don't wink. WNUF does in really tiny places wink at you. But if you caught like a 10 minute run of that, you'd be like, oh, that's totally genuine or something like that. Yeah. But if you watch it all the way through, you can see a narrative take place, but it's cleverly done. It's done as if it is a relic of the time, like House of the Devil was meant to be a convincing 80s, 80s uh, horror film. Right. It, this was com- like this was meant to be like convince you it's real found footage which really hadn't been a thing since Blair Witch Project where people like, even though it was a film and all this stuff, like, like, well, fine. if people are going to believe it's real, then we're going to play into this for marketing a bit, um, which rarely comes about because they always are a bit hokey and found, but it's a tough thing. And WNUF, um, when I've done, so I've done a lot of research on it since seeing the movie and stuff, but that was made with that intention was what don't we like about found footage movies? How do we make it convincing? What, what era would we like it to be in? And did they did wanted to make it like you didn't wink and they wanted to sell it. They, they left the movie in bathrooms in comic book stores on bootleg yeah. tables, like just for people to find just to build the lore of what is this a genuine? And I will say this when I was, uh, looking up around stuff for um the the first one for last week with Jessica I found somebody had illegally put it up on YouTube and I decided you know what I'm going to read the comments on this video there were arguments about whether it was real or not in the comments so that's just a testament to the good work they did perfect perfect <laughs> so now we are here with um the out there halloween mega tape the sequel, which I had no idea until a couple months ago existed. I instantly got on buying it. I didn't even know they were making it. But it is once again directed by Chris, Chris LaMartina, written by Chris LaMartina. I imagine Jimmy George has something to do with it. I don't think the full credits have been released from this movie yet. Um, the cast stars Ted Geogan, Sean Jones, Melissa Le, Mar- Le Martina, and Michael Verratti. Uh, the plot is a daytime talk show host finds herself placed on a new program and investigating a farmstead with a long history of alien encounters. Again, this is um, what they've done here is they've set up some things that are actual meant to be like actual relics of the past um, taking place. This one takes place in the 90s, I believe, specifically 93 and 96 or something like that, somewhere around there. Yeah, um, 96 is the um, Halloween night broadcast. Yes. But I interpreted the Ivy Sparks episode to be 93. Yes. But... Um, this has commercials again. That was a fan favorite thing of the first one, which some of them, in the original, like they were farmed out to some filmmakers to do. But um, here's the interesting thing. Why they look so genuine is because... Uh, La Martina has been given clearance and rights to use from news places old package footage from the era that they're just like, it just sits here. We we shot these for commercials. We shot these for this, but they just sit around doing nothing. All the people have signed off on their name for usage on whatever go to town. So a lot of these... Like when you see like a state fair footage, it's yeah just the news package from the era that he was given, sent, given the rights to, uh, things like that. So that's why it, it can look really era specific. Yeah. And, you know, it's weird to explain to people if they didn't, um, 
grow up slash live at the time but um the the first one really got the 80s television mm-hmm. quality the yeah. local tv station film quality what that looked like and not just that but the programs that ran on it mm-hmm. and a great example of this and i don't know if you remember it is do you remember when they had the live action tv series of photon based on like the laser tag like game photon okay okay because it ran in syndication and that special effects quality was terrible Mm -hmm. but it was like the space show in yeah 80 segments in the commercial but as much as they did that with the 80 stuff they also managed to do it in out there with the 90s footage and the overall understanding of what everything about the decade looked like from the news to the commercials and so forth is really kind of mind blowing because it's so immersive. It's insane. It's insane. Like it is like once again, genuine. It, yep. It's really weird. Um and we're gonna go into like a lot of it and stuff, but it, it's crazy. Like I know I don't know. The details. I purposely didn't listen to the commentary for this one. Um, I listened to the two from the. There's now two commentaries on the on the first one, which I know in the first one they used a mini DV camera um, to shoot all their footage, and then they transferred it to VHS, and then they, after you know, the film was done, they transferred it, I believe, four times. For mo- for some of the footage, some of the footage was three times. Um, VHS just keep copying over, and that was about the they said the best, genuine and watchable they could get. They could get it doing that. So um, a lot of the the tracking stuff that happens, that's genuine from copying VHS is over. It's not some filter or or what have you. Um, but that they've managed to do it. and I they managed to do it again. And I think what's awesome too about this is. They managed to make something that it's his, it's its own movie, but it answers questions and stuff from the first one. Yes, just without. I mean, if you if you want, because like I, there's parts when they start calling back and and moving forward on stuff in the first one where I perked up like, what? Oh, this is gonna happen. We're gonna oh, and they do it in such a natural way that like you could enjoy this movie by itself, but you really enjoy it. If you saw the first one, right to the last scene yes. of out there. And that I couldn't believe that they mm-hmm. kind of pulled that off, that they, they had the entire through line. Yeah. So, but to assemble it, it also in a way that it hits right. Yeah. Is, is a feat. It's yeah. it's a storytelling and editing feat to make yeah. that land, mm-hmm. especially after what's just happened, right? In in the climax, yeah. And it like you know, WNF Halloween Special is a movie that like it just was what it was. Probably wouldn't you know? Would never I never imagined it'd be a sequel, and here we are. And this one tell it's it's a great sequel because it manages to tell its own thing, be a sequel, and close the book not leave anything hanging too so yeah whether we get a third one or not we're we're set like it'll be a gift like this was <laughs> yeah um but i i decided uh troy like the last time uh we, we kind of sp- split it into segments and sections of this film to dissect so i did that again and i was going to go with um there's like a bit before things start that we'll talk about for a sec. Um, but we'll talk about Ivy Sparks and the commercials that happen there. We'll talk about the little news segment in between because that has commercials around it. We'll talk about the the uh, out there special and then uh, the ads that come with that and then the uh, the epilogue with that. So I figured right on. we would do that. So let's start with the tape when you put it in. It's actually a DVD, uh, but we have the Tony Taper Tony's Trader Dungeon, which is a bootleg service uh, type thing, which 
these were in Fangoria all the time. Like they were in the back, they did little one ad yeah. section there call. You get these cool. This is how, this is how like a kid in the Midwest would see like, um, city of the living dead. Um, <laughs> you know, you'd order right. horror movies and stuff like that. It, it extended to music too. Um, mm-hmm. then, you know, the, uh, great black and white newsprint zine maximum rock and roll were from the, punk scene and so forth they had pages and pages of tape traders and people would send uh, audio and video cassettes and they would also have ads for small labels and whatnot and um my best friend sean would get you know that's how we saw like the legendary gg allen and (laughs) stuff like that because we get these these videotapes that you know sean jason these guys would get and trade them around and we'd Mm -hmm. see you know, here's Jane's Addiction playing at a skate park in 1986. You know, yeah, kind of yeah. Thing. And it was just like crazy stuff that was there for the taking because people had built a pre internet network of this is how the stuff right. gets around. Yeah. There was, I mean, there's Trader Store. I mean, there's like on um on one of the Doctor Who Blu rays, there's a great story about people trading taped episodes back in the day because they didn't yeah. sell them all. And, and stuff like that. And there's uh, probably that for a lot of classic television shows and, you know, uh, music, of course, bootleg oh, yeah. concerts and, and things like that. Uh, Grateful Dead. What is, they called it blanks and postage is what the for bootleg concerts and stuff would be. We're in um, in in Terre Haute, where I grew up, there was a segment of the city uh, because of two competing cable systems. One mm-hmm. did not have MTV. And oh. even when I was in high school, people would record 120 minutes and bring it in. And that tape would get passed around through the week. And then oh. the next episode would get recorded on the same tape. <laughs> and then passed around. Oh, that's so great. Sometimes there'd be fragments of the beginning, the endings of other episodes. And then like, you know, here would be Dave Kendall and, you know, the Pixies in front 242 and whatever. And then the next week would be. And then, of course, you know, by the time it achieved its coverage and all that you know, i used to do a story i just do a thing where i would uh, go fishing in the middle of the night where i would uh put a tape in and just record mtv while i was sleeping to see what yep. random or old music videos would pop up in the middle of the night that they would show that they wouldn't show during the day yeah and so i could see them or collect them in some way just kind of a thing because i'm like Cause I, I would find like, like I never, the only way I ever saw, and I don't know why, but the, the smashing pumpkins video for zero only ever aired at like 3 AM and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. And I was like, wow, that was a big song after album, but they never played that video. And I had, I remember to see it a second time. I had to like download it on my computer back. And this is like 96. Yeah. So it took forever. Ooh, took forever. Didn't look that great. Yeah. I, f- I forget what the file extension even was on it, but I was yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> I said, Wait, could you get off the phone? I'm like, no, I'm downloading zero by the smash points. It's a three minute video. It's going to take three days. <laughs> yeah. So crazy. Um. So yeah, we have this like bumper at the beginning for this, this taper Tony's trader dungeon. That's where it comes from. Uh, the bot, the the case for the the DVD looks like one of those ads that you would see, uh, in a magazine, and that's a very specific thing. Yeah. Too that they're that they're getting they're getting completely right. You you'd have something you know the generic metal riff playing while, like, like scandal club like women sex scenes and all the explosions like some four wheeler going by you know it's all sorts of extreme stuff before extreme was a catchphrase. Yeah. Uh. But yeah, after that, we we begin at the tail end of like an episode called Excalibur. <laughs> yeah, which it's kind of funny. It looks like a cartoon Power Rangers thing. Yeah. Um, I did catch that this was supposed to be a live action thing, but money ran out or time, so they just animated it like they did. Which there's a lot of animated shows that look like Ninja Turtles look like this show. Yeah, yeah. yeah th- there's. That that's another like very nineties function, two levels mm-hmm. where you had shows that were produced in other countries that were purchased and redubbed and adapted for the states that animated, of course, but also 
the the super sentai shows in japan of which Mm -hmm. power rangers was one and a lot of these shows were all different shows but were purchased and edited into the states to become a continuity of right one show like voltron was different shows that were you know edited to become a series called voltron robotech was three different shows yeah yeah you know that was and 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 that carries that entire vibe (laughs) yeah yeah i remember yeah robotech i used to rent those on vhs they had the clamshell case back in the day and yeah and i remember i got so mad i rented one and it ended i was like what because had this cliffhanger i got mad i turned it off da 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 and told my parents like it only had like a 30 minutes on it da, 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 and watch it again and then i got the end i left the room and all of a sudden i heard stuff i'm like oh there's more on this tape oh okay <laughs> i saw credits and assumed it was over learned a, <laughs> learned a lesson learned a lesson um so yeah that that leads into our ivy sparks show the ivy sparks halloween spooktacular which is 1000 percent ricky lake It's a dark and stormy afternoon, and all the creatures of the night have gotten up a little bit early to raise the dead with yours truly. So come on, gang, open up that candy you were saving for trick-or-treaters and dim the lights, because this is going to be a scream. Um, the logo is Ricky Lake's reversed yeah. and she looks, she's got the Ricky Lake look. Um, this is talk shows were in a full swing in the nineties. Um, and they were beyond being like serious things at this point, or I don't know if they were trash television by this point, but popular trash television. Yeah, there, there's a there's an arc to this which some of the viewers may not know, but um, daytime television talk shows have been around in all kinds of incarnations for years. You know, mm-hmm. you had like in the '60s and '70s, um, like your your Dick Cavett and your Merv Griffin and so forth. But then, like, kind of the, the big one in the '70s was Donahue, you know, Phil Donahue, mm-hmm. um, and Donahue did a lot of socially relevant stuff and a lot of groundbreaking stuff, and he had. You know, transgender people on to talk about them with some seriousness, which was a thing that didn't happen yeah. at the time. And then, you know, Oprah comes in in the 80s and becomes hugely popular. And with the daytime slugfest, the equivalent of Leno versus Letterman um, on 80s daytime TV it was Oprah and Donahue. But by the time it gets to the 90s, Oprah has kind of asserted her dominance. And there's a second thing going on with syndication. Um the picture of syndicated TV changed in the seventies with what hours people could syndicate stuff and everything. And so um, the networks gave the seven to 8 PM hour back to the locals and a lot of TV got generated um, like soul train and whatnot that was created for these extra hours to fill. Mm -hmm. But then the soap operas started getting canceled as they used to rule daytime because they're too expensive because of all the casts and stuff. And a yeah. lot of these hours started to get filled with talk shows because it was easy to do a talk show. You could pay the host and the staff and have the studio, but you could fill it with regular people and you could just book an endless succession of weirdos. And so the talk shows post Oprah exploded and there was nothing too salacious or anything. And you had like the, the Jenny Jones, the Sally Jester FBL, the Montel Williams, the Morton Downey Juniors, the mm-hmm. Charles Perez's, and Ricky Lake, of course, as you said. Yep. But there's this, you know, stream, and some of these guests would circuit. <laughs> yeah. The the talk shows, uh, but they would go for the most outrageous stuff. I already mentioned Gigi Allen, the mm-hmm. punk artist who would do all kinds of outrageous stuff. Uh, he was on these shows a lot. And, you know, they would have those 
ambush makeovers and all of these things right. they were a staple of all of that the the vibe of this is so authentic yeah yeah and it's it's so authentic and i i feel like was it ricky lake was one of them that was like a cross between your your oprah and your because i feel like she at first like maybe wanted to be taken kind of seriously and then kind of became the rest but she was like a Regulate was like an actor and then did yeah. one of these, unlike was, some of the other people. Oprah was, was an actor, John too. John Waters' but... hairspray. And Serial Mom, too. She was a yeah. John Waters player, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, th- this whole uh, thing of that, the the graphics that they use and the catchphrase, like, be nice and all that, yep. that is just so on point for what it was and like oh here's our halloween episode with the and she's dressed like cleopatra which i remember wasn't that thing with ricky lake too she was chunky and then she got skinny that was like that was like a big deal like she lost weight um and then she did like diet pill things too or something on the side right i think um but yeah this is aliens vamps and phantom tramps what they called this episode um she's got a studio audience they're all dressed up for halloween um and they actually got a nice looking studio yeah uh, the, the one thing that they would do on these shows that i'm not sure if they got going on here is they use these lenses that made these auditoriums look humongous when they're really like super yeah. small like if you've ever actually seen where they shoot uh the tonight show or things like that it is small um, yeah, and they just have these wide lenses that make the audience look quite big. Um, but you know, this is a low budget thing, so I do what it is. But I, you know, I buy maybe it's the early years of Ivy Sparks too. Um, <laughs> but I also noticed too with WNUF, it's now become um an affiliate. Um, yes, uh, that will be more in play yeah. later. But it is Ace, which is one hundred percent. They went to Fox. Yeah. Yeah, they've got the little searchlight logo on the left hand side, like the little effect of the uh yeah, box which, logo. Which is funny because I said in the WNUF one that um that one reminded me most of a channel growing up in Fort Wayne called Super 55, which became Fox <laughs> as well. So this is like yeah. playing to Brandon really, really dear here. This is uh uh Phila Martina, uh the director of this seems to know if they, they're from Jersey. Uh, but I believe these take place in Minnesota is the uh, idea behind these. Um, so our our first guest is Stefan the Vampire on this show. This actually plays like a full episode, like a half hour version. These talk shows were typically an hour long, but we got a movie to do here. Um, so he plays in a band called Immortal Dagger, which is a new style of death rock. He drinks blood had dental surgery to turn his teeth into fangs. He gets a mainstream. And, oh, the thing is, they they, they, they uh, av- uh, avalanche with a mainstream makeover from his cousin that says, freak to chic faster than you can say Transylvania twist. So this guy, Troy, you have an anecdote here, and I cannot wait to hear this. I, I don't know if it's an anecdote so much as a side quest. But, side quest, um, okay. All right. I, I've got to do a, a little tiny personal sad setup and then branch into it um so in i had a friend um from the college era named james ellidge james is a musician did mm-hmm. blues stuff he was a redheaded white dude if you guys know who richard thompson is the classic musician uh richard and linda thompson okay uh, shoot out the lights um he looked exactly like richard thompson and he oh. wore a beret all the time too and he also favored wearing sunglasses even at night, which led me to nickname him Blind oh. Jimmy. Oh. And but yeah. James is a good friend of mine. And um in the early 2000s, James passed away suddenly. Hmm. Um it that was that was a whole weird thing. I talked to him on the phone. Um, and later that night he passed away, brain event. So it was a very big shock. And you know, it was a thing that I carried with me fast forward a little bit i'm writing for newsarama doing comic book reviews and everything i was always getting stuff sent to me free stuff and solicited and everything and i got 
a uh, vampire comic book called Grave Girls sent to me. Okay. That had great art in it. And it was uh, an independently produced book, but it had some some great artists doing the cover, some well-known people. And um, there was a guy um, who was the writer of this book. And, um, you know, it was really cool. I talked to him online for a few times. I gave the book a good review. So I went to the Chicago Comic-Con later that year, uh, Wizard World Chicago, and I'm in the uh, Artist Alley. And I happen to notice this kind of big display, and I'm walking toward it, and I see this guy. And the guy looks exactly like my friend blind jimmy who okay. died a few years ago but then i get close and i see the display is for the grave girls booth and the guy that i saw looked like jimmy was scott the the dude okay and so so then i'm like oh man i told and i stopped and i talked to him and i was like i'm sorry but i was taken aback because you know you look like my friend and then after a while i thought you know he looked familiar in another sense, like maybe I know him from somewhere else too. Anyway, mm-hmm. all right. Paused. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so I come to find out that this guy um had for a good chunk of the 80s been Vlad from the Dark Theater the band from Chicago that was like a goth vampire band. And he presented himself as a vampire that drank blood and stuff and appeared on all these talk shows. Oh, and shit. I had seen him. Oh on my gosh. The talk show at the day. He's in the vampire book, the encyclopedia of the undead by Gordon mm. Melton. And there's a whole section on oh, black. Wow. They have whole sections on goth rock and different bands and everything. And there's a whole section, even a picture of him with <sighs> the hair and the teeth yeah. and all that. Now, and he he lived that gig for a long time. His mm-hmm. band performed at the Dracula Centennial at Whitby in eighteen <laughs> in nineteen uh, ninety seven. There is video of that. After this. He got more. He went and he did the soundtracks for Chaos Comics, the oh. Purgatory soundtrack and stuff. He did the Earth X soundtrack for Marvel's book oh. that Alex Ross did. Oh, he wow. was the guy that composed and did all the music for those soundtracks. And after a while, the whole Vlad thing went away, and he did some other stuff. Like he's in Russo's. Night of the Living Dead Anniversary Edition, the oh, preacher character, the the one where they added a new scene. Yeah. Oh, the preacher character is him. Oh, and so, but then by this late two thousands, you know, he's doing he he well, the early two thousands, like oh oh six ish or so, he's doing comics, and so he and I were talking about doing comics together, mm-hmm. and he goes away to do a couple of shows. He calls me one day. He's like, hey, man, we're still going to do comics, except now we're going to be doing them for Fangoria. (laughs) Okay. And that's how I got involved in the whole Fangoria thing. Oh, wow. Okay. So, um, and that's like the shortest possible version I'm going to make of this, but because I have much more to say on that whole thing another time. But when this started, in the movie and the guy came out and it's like he's the musician and he's a vampire and, he, and i was just sitting there like <laughs> like oh my god did brandon know this story because i don't think i've ever told him this story oh did he somehow god. find out in other things i've said online did he <laughs> intuit did he know my connection with these other people that might have made him connect the dots it's like is this why he asked me to do this because i was sitting there just like no i asked you to do this before i even saw the movie (laughs) and so i saw that i watched that whole thing just like (laughs) just like that the whole the whole bit it was just stunning to me so i'm gonna tell you that's fucking accurate (laughs) (laughs) oh my god it's a The, the whole thing of the the, the sensation dramatization 
put wow. them on there. And so I'm like, and, and I, I said this to you in our um, online conversation after I watched it, but mm-hmm. they had to know, right? Right. I mean, that's, that's, it's got to be him. Yeah. Does it? I mean, it, like the idea that there were a whole bunch of these guys that were as well documented and so forth, it's, it's almost beggars belief yeah. that it would be another character. They had to have been inspired in some part by the whole dark theater and Vlad story. Right. I mean, no, it, it's, yeah, that's, I mean, he, judging off how they made the, WNUF and the amount of detail and wanting to get things right and only going with what they know and be able to replicate it. They must, they must know about what you know about you. You're old, yeah. you're old vampire buddy. Well, uh, and I find it fun because the actor that they cast for Stefan kind of looks like Peter Steele from typo negative, like a less attractive version of. Yeah. Well, Peter he, Steele, but... you know, he is um, he's from the WNUF. Um, he was one of the people that um, were outside the I believe he's one of the people that were outside the the house Oh, uh, yeah, when he's yeah. with Frank Stewart. And he's the one that when they ask, he's like, did you know this was haunted or whatever? And he's like, what haunted? What? He's that guy. The, um, that's I believe who that is that they put on here. Um as him i think that's who it is but um yeah he is a person who's in both uh but yeah it's that's great um but this is the type of person they would have on these shows yeah and 100 percent. and i love the the little video they play of his intro and they, i like how they have her there acting like she's interested or cares you know and she has the lighter up and 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 watching watching him intently with his vampirism and stuff and this like you know having him pose to do stuff like okay uh and then of course they have the makeover come like, i kind of knew that's where this would this segment would go i'm like oh it's gonna be a makeover <laughs> we came out. um and they have the jackass cousin like it's a cousin that comes out like yeah. not a brother not a parent not a sip you know like not a girlfriend Ted his cousin and he comes out like a jackass with the little masquerade ma- thing on and yeah oh well th- this is another historical bit for the the, the ambush was part of most mm-hmm. of these shows the ambush yeah. by your crush the ambush for a makeover the and and the thing that really stopped that was um a Jenny Jones episode that actually led to a murder oh that was um well, I, I I can't remember the the exact specifics off the top of my head, so let me walk that back. Someone died, okay. but it was um, a uh, person that was ambushed with their crush, and it turned out to be a same sex crush, and they were you know humiliated and all this, and mm. stuff happens, and someone's no longer living, and then there were lawsuits and whatnot, and the that oh, really geez. put a you know stake through the heart of the ambush thing. Yeah, on on the daytime talk shows, we'll we'll have to look that up later. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, the promo key. What Troy meant was <laughs> it was much worse than what Troy said. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, then, I don't know about that. Then they go to they go to a commercial, and always between these, they they genuinely they have like a number to call if you want to be like if you know somebody. This first one is: Has violent media turned your child into a delinquent? Call us at da 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 and to be on the show. And so they do that as their segments. Um so um we also have ads during during this. We'll get to the, the ad we'll we'll do the show, then we'll do the ads, then we'll do the thing. Yeah. Um we get an update on um Lewis and Claire Berger with our next guest. Because we have their niece who comes out um, to talk about stuff. So um, th- I, I did find it funny. So they introduce us to the history of Lewis and Claire Berger, um, but things about their career. And I left, they, they wrote a book called Amish Frankenstein, <laughs> which uh, I think is funny. Brave robbing in Pennsylvania, Dutch country. <laughs> yes. Uh, so 
And we also get a note that since the so everybody from the last movie at the end of it that were murdered, we saw murdered are considered missing. They're not found. They're, so they're missing. And so that's a big mystery. We find out Veronica Stanzi, the producer of it that was outside during it. She launched a big talk show career herself. Um, and we have Zoe Martin, the niece of the burgers, who's got a book to push. Um, and she thinks aliens have taken her aunt and uncle. Um, and there's just so this one that you got this like weird back and forth between Ivy and Zoe that's just uncomfortable to watch. Yeah. Like yeah. It it carries the air of, you know, one side knows more than the other. And it's, you know, Mm -hmm. the host. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Is but you know, for 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 those playing at home, Captain Footnote says, uh the burgers, if in case you didn't watch the first movie or are true, the burgers were definitely based on Ed and Lorraine Warren. Mm -hmm. Uh, right down to the point where they say investigator and his psychic wife. Um, but you know, and Ed and Lorraine Warren, if you're familiar with the Conjuring films, were real people, and most people consider them charlatans, etc. And um, I did write about them at the Saturday Evening Post. If you want to uh, yeah. use the search, yes, function. you did. But um, you know, it, it's that that basis of that um, was you know transferred over and modified a little bit because '90s was a big UFO time. Mm-hmm. With we'll get to alien autopsy and stuff like that but there was a big proliferation of ufo shows like you know strange encounters and things like that so, we even had the movie fire in the sky yeah it was big during then too um yeah so that's that's her thing and she won't talk about she's like well if you read the book you know that that type of thing can't give it all and they bring out another gotcha person another ambush um with uh the the Grim Reaper, but it ends up being this guy named Perry Trenchard, host of the talk show, You're Lying, the talk radio show, You're Lying. Uh, and he says, your aunt and uncle were con artists, and it looks like the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And she attacks him and gets one of those brawls they like to have yeah. on those shows. And they have their uh, version of uh, Jerry Springer's Steve, who comes out and separates. Right. Them. And he's wearing balloons for Halloween. <laughs> yeah. He's just got balloons on him. Um, but, yeah. So, yeah, so we get that little update on Lewis and Claire Berger um, from that um, authors of Pen Pals from Beyond. Um, so there's like the touch. Of, so now we know like, OK, things might get acknowledged from the original film. This is our first um, continuation of anything from it. And we yeah. know now that the bodies of Frank Stewart and the Burgers, the the intern, the the actor who played the priest. Um, have not been found but we know they're dead yeah but it's interesting to see and it's going to play into the mentality like you're talking about the 90s of our explanation is not ghosts anymore it's aliens uh, yeah so uh we go to a commercial bumper with are you extremely overweight and dating someone twice your age <laughs> <laughs> those <laughs> Those guest solicitations are perfection. Every one of those killed me. It was and just... they're not far off at all. They're no, on the money. They, they, they seem rather genuine. The, the thing I like, they're not going extreme. That's that's the thing. They are they're like they're funny to us, but they were funny back then too. Yeah. That's the thing. There that's where they have it. Um the next person uh we're gonna go, um, is this lesbian Ouija board ghost romance thing that happens with this girl named Heidi May. Um, and there's some Civil War era ghost she's having an affair with, and she needs to confess it to her husband, Joe Mark. And uh, they're both dressed like scarecrow, raggedy Ann and Andy type things to talk about it. And um, she confesses, and he's kind of like, Oh, when he finds out it's not a man, that it's a woman ghost, he's kind of like, Oh. And then they have the Ouija board come out and talk to it. And what it asks the ghost when it wants, it smells out menage a trois. But he's like, menage, menage, <laughs> Maynag. Um, And uh, that's kind of how that one was out. But yeah, there's 
there's always I remember there was the confessing ones, which is usually like, oh, I'm sleeping with your brother. And the brother comes yeah. out and is like, hey. And then fist fight starts. And- yep. That's what that's how those would go. Um, we have one more bumper and it's are you pregnant with the child of a relative? We want to host your baby shower. <laughs> so, yeah. And uh, yeah, then we bring back out our vampire makeover and he I thought something bad was going to happen here because everybody's laughing and he's just like, this is awful. Please stop filming me. But I was like, is he going to like kill somebody on the screen or something like that? But no, it's just the credits and everybody doing their thing. And uh, Small Talk, the only talk show hosted by a dwarf, is coming up next. Because <laughs> you would, in this era, you would have a talk show followed by a talk show. Followed by a talk show. Followed I by mean... a talk show, followed by the local news. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. Um, I, I worked for a radio station in college, a local one that was also, there were two radio stations and a TV station in, in the same building. And that TV station was a CBS affiliate. So it was pretty mm. thick with game shows and soap operas. And then it would fall into a couple of hours of talk. And they had Oprah. Oh, okay. But then on the competing stations, like on the Fox stations, you had probably four solid hours of talk. Like, you know, Ricky Lake, Jerry Springer, et cetera. And it was... This is why kids didn't like being stuck at home. That's all we had on the, if you didn't have cable. Yeah. yeah that's what you were stuck with soap operas. And granted, as a kid, a uh, sci fi channel, I would watch Dark Shadows reruns. But <laughs> so I guess I was guilty in the soap opera category. But I was watching yeah, but... old ass sitcom or old ass soap opera. There's a big difference between like a run of the mill soap opera and a show that transports the entire cast of the 1800s for six months. I mean, true, you know, true. <laughs> There's yes. a little bit of difference. Very true. Um, yeah. So that that show like legitimately ends, and during the show and before it, we had commercials, which is a big part of these movies because they air these as if they're on a tape and go through. And this. I don't think it happened in this one, uh, but the previous one would fast forward and stuff through commercials. I don't think yeah. this one fast forwarded at all. I think we went through straight through all of them. Um, we had one of the first ones is Dr. Pizza. I've got a prescription for pepperoni. Each box comes with stickers and a comic strip, which when you freeze those things, how well do they stick? And I was just yeah. thinking about that. <laughs> but yeah, Dr. Pizza it was like frozen pizza, right? Pretty yeah. sure it was, yeah. Because that was Dr. the thing. Pizza. They were big in the 90s. Um, We had Cutie Cutes, which um, probably Beanie Baby. Th- Beanie thing. Babies, yeah. Yeah. Uh, all had S names, I noted. When they were going through the yeah. names of them, they all had S names. I did like aerospecific CF rollers, the rollerblades. Yes. It was so cool. Because we all rollerbladed, and then all of a sudden it became uncool. And yep. nobody, nobody spoke of it again. Like, yeah, it was it was it weird. Was it weird. Just drop that. I would do it around campus. You rollerblade. You play hockey outside. You look cooler playing hockey outside with them. Yeah, it was really bizarre that the rollerblade fad. That yeah, I think I think some of it went away because it got somehow associated. Uh, with gay men, so there's like a big homophobia thing about rollerblades. Is that I think that's kind of got pushed. I don't know. I think that uh, mine just fell off as a. I, I I couldn't really tell you. It was just like we were doing it, and then went, and then we weren't. <laughs> yeah, it was there and there. Um, I had my pair. Uh, we have Phil's Carpet Warehouse is back, having his cosmic clearance sale. He's back. He's still in business for now. Um, <laughs> and we have the uh, plug for the Out There television show with yes. host Tate Dawson, which we'll we'll find the the, the old version because like I noticed the the graphics kind of changed because yeah. you know three years went by, so it looks a little different with Tate Dawson. Um, very contrast from uh uh frank stewart different 
different type. Yeah. Um, there was a global warming rap. There was a, a rude awakening thing. Uh, do you have any highlights personally, Troy, from this first batch of commercials that you remember? Um, frankly, I can't remember if they had one of the extreme energy drinks in this one, but that became a recurring mm-hmm. thing uh, that I noted because that was a big 90s thing was like extreme soda, extreme energy drinks. So they have Jolt three Cola, distinct yeah. brands that happened throughout the movie. <laughs> Yeah, I I don't think we had that here. Yeah. Um, we had primal fruit juice, the missing drink in your fridge. Yes. Uh, there is um the giggle zone, which was a two hour block of laughs, which was sitcoms. Yeah. Which which you know was another thing that um. You know the the syndicated shows that were. You know, fairly low budget. They're created for syndicated market. Small Here, wonder. Small wonder. Exactly what I was thinking of. Uh, um, not of, out of this world. Mm-hmm. Um, all those kind of shows. Frequently, they would revive older shows that had been canceled. Mm-hmm. Like we got it made and stuff. Where it's a living. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> were ported to syndication, and sold in these blocks that would run on the right. independent channels. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, that, that's what happened. I mean, you would have a life. That's how you would revisit. Things got canceled back in the day, and we just lived for the reruns. We didn't go, "Hey, it's been forty years, and no one watched it then, but maybe people watch it now." Let's get everybody back together. See what happens. <laughs> so we do. And this one's genius because not only did they come up with a commercial, they came up with a, a jingle, super duper water shooter. Oh yeah, super duper water shooter. Is it? It's obviously super soakers, which were humongous then. Yeah, that yeah, that. Like, oh, yeah, I had them. Yeah, I think. Um, I think I wrote about that in the uh, greatest toys of all time, uh, three parter I did a couple years ago for Christmas for the post was uh, oh, okay. I definitely had a super soaker entry in there because uh that that really changed the landscape of what a water gun was because for many many years it was just like little plastic thing with the Mm -hmm. white rubber stopper that would fall out and then there was a brief moment in the 80s where they tried to make them look like real machine guns the inner tech battery operated ones which you know lasted right up until people started getting shot at by police for having like what they used in uh airheads yeah, used to and have then, those, yeah. Very quickly, super soakers, which look nothing like regular guns, had the giant tanks, bright colors, and were just a massive success. Yeah, and, you can do that. You pump them up for the air the water pressure to go up, and then all of a sudden you had reserve tanks, you had different like spray shooters, you could change the nozzle. Like, yeah, it was backpacks. Back- backpacks yep. of water. Oh my gosh. It made going to the pool. It changed the game on going to the pool. Slides <laughs> were out. Super soakers were in. Yep. Yeah. Um, we w- we have the bogeys trailer, which is the like these like, I mean I don't know if it was taken on the boogans, but they're like uh there's you know the little ghoulies and critters yeah, and stuff. I this was, is ghoulies is what I was thinking of. This is the ones that like hot like they terrorized a mini golf place. So that was a fun one. Um, there's get them in denim. Randall's all jeans half off. Uh, Jarvis Peck's control. It's rather. I love how they. I would say that, like they know not to just keep going for comedy with everything. So you'll get like a yeah. straight commercial that'll just click like, oh, that's like a, that's a memory. Um, I did like the the trailer for Blood Gavel Three: The Final Verdict. Yeah, that was- that, that's another. The um, really specific type was the, you know, it. You don't see widespread television advertising for cheap movies yeah. anymore. We don't we have, have like the night. Yeah, it's not cool to have a movie anymore. Like everybody's got them, you know. Yeah, because I remember, you know, uh, films like Eliminators got trailers and TV commercials. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the tv spot that's one of the things i I used to 
I used to not care for on uh, DVD like bonus features and stuff, but now I live for like the trailers and TV spots being included, especially TV spots because they'll go for different angles and different. You can tell they were that was going to air on this kind of network or this one or or they were trying to plug a soundtrack with this one. Uh, yeah, but and but these are like the syndicate like. We bought a movie. We're going to run it on our Saturday package, which just doesn't. Now it's just all like, well, we're showing all the Harry Potter movies again. Yeah. This weekend. Like, like back in my day, like you, the marathons were once in a blue moon and maybe you didn't get all of them. But now, like, if you were in, interested in Harry Potter and just you can put on a channel and watch them, if you're even if you don't have streaming services some channels showing it all yeah. day long. Yeah. TBS had 13 days of bond. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then uh, a couple of stations would maybe show the original star Wars trilogy around the holidays. U USA. They would and do it. then yep. Friday the 13th every... on USA up all night. They would do the weekend marathons. Yeah. And, and then everything else was random. Yeah. You, you could get exposed to a huge variety of films across decades on weekends. Just, I mean, USA had Kung Fu Theater mm -hmm. and Commander USA's groovy movies and other things. And we had our local horror hosts, our Sammy Terry's and whatnot. Yep. But just in the middle of the day, you could find High Plains Drifter. Yeah. You could find Taxi Driver. <laughs> Granted, edited for television. Right. It would just be there. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, there was a Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon movie. Um, and they had oh, what was it? Uh, what was it going with this? Um, never mind. I lost my thought. Craziness, but yeah, these these movies that they would they would put on, it'd be fine. They would they treat it like everything else, a big deal. Um, the Saturday afternoon movie, we return you yeah. to Sylvester Stallone in Over the Top, you know, like, yeah. and you just, that that's what would be on. You tape it off TV, um, be TV edits, but yeah, I, I, sci-fi channel, this is where I was going with this. Just imagine this kids, you got, a. they had an anime week and that was like the only anime you could ever find on television the whole year it was one week of anime, yeah. five to six movies. That's it. Like that, that was, um, that was it that you got an anime week. Um, when Cartoon Network started children, <laughs> anime was not a priority. Nope. And then they started putting on late nights. <laughs> yep. Exactly. And that was it. Toonami. You have, you know, maybe Dragon Ball became a staple early on, but mm -hmm. they would show one movie, maybe. On the weekend, like Blue Submarine number six, yep. something like that. And, you know, Insane. nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else. It's, yeah, so crazy. Um, But uh, we have King's Trucking School. We have a tarot reading. Remember? Those were big. Oh, yeah, yeah. Call, yeah. call and read you know, the tarot. Phone psychic, just $4 a minute. Yeah, $4 a minute. Keep going. And just about the time when that four minutes is up, I'm going to say something that you're going to want to hear the rest of it, but you're going to do pay the rest. Of it. Uh, there's an AIDS commercial of get tested. Yep. It's just funny. I think that probably get tested probably came in during COVID when they were making this, that probably came up. Um, Sterling life insurance, uh, a MIAC chocolate. Some, there's some creepy Holland, like purple thing selling this, this little kind of like, Oh, eat your chocolate, MIAC chocolate. Yeah, which like I have to. Troll. I wonder if it's a play on Ernest Scared Stupid, uh, when he has the Miak, but it's called Miak Chocolate. There's pumpkin cat food. Yeah, that's good. Uh, and we have the Lone Ranger, L O A N, cash in a flash for whatever you need. He don't care. Uh, the, oh, and the, the last one here is, uh the marijuana commercial with the skeletons and the kid like, who cares if we get high? It's not like we're going to die. Right guys. And it's right. like, this is the kind of shit they sold us about marijuana back then. Like, yeah, you'll die. Yep. It wasn't quite, um, roofy madness, but it was like very, 
subtly hinting to just awful stuff with marijuana. It will kill you. It will kill you. Or it's a gateway. It's a gateway, gateway drug. Gateway drug. Um. So then we, we go into the tape skips up and we have Captain Blaze. He's doing the lottery numbers. He's dressed up in costume. Uh, but we, of course, lead into the WNUF news update with uh, returning Deborah Merritt and Gavin Gordon now Yay! just as the bride and as the devil. And, you know, I, I kind of wanted an update on Deborah's cats, but we did not. Get we one. did not. They didn't. <laughs> you know, they, they could have just done these two again and they didn't. I I like that they show they gave us a little return for them but they it's a news update rather than a full news broadcast we get we find out phil's carpet warehouse is being charged with money laundering (laughs) that's kind of funny uh we get the cop giving the halloween safety thing again and he says he goes drunk driver he's about this drunk driver who killed kids and he goes don't get smashed like those two little pumpkins (laughs) like (laughs) oh man yeah uh, I, that that note cracked me up. I mean, I laughed out loud because that was kind of the. It, it was a little out of place in the '90s, but it was very much the vibe of the uh, like bus safety videos. We oh had yeah, 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 yep. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like Jenny would never ride the bus again. <laughs> yes. Oh, like when you're in driver's ed, and they're like, yeah. Oh, driver. Yep. So you want to hear something crazy? In our driver's ed. I took it at like Safeway driving school. I didn't take it at my school. Um, but we had to watch this video about railroad tracks and stuff and train safety and all the dangers of not taking it seriously. And in the video we're watching, one of our school bus drivers was in it. And she was talking about like a child of hers that got hit by a train, not taking it seriously. Like, we learned like this dark secret of one of our bus drivers because wow. we went to driver's train. We're like, Oh my God. Crazy. It was crazy. Like, yeah, oh. I, I have a very specific uh, memory of the bus safety film death zones, which you can find on YouTube. Hmm. <laughs> Excellent. Death so, zones. Um, in that, uh, in the news thing, they talk about the out there, Halloween special being filmed in town. It's going live tonight, and it has Ivy Sparks, whose show had been canceled, and she's now the new co-host of Out There. So we get a little transcendent of Ivy Sparks um, and her new gig, and that's going to be filmed in town, um, which leads us to the Out There Halloween special, which is on WNUF Ace 28. Viewer discretion is advised. UFOs, crop circles, unexplained sightings of alien beings. Hundreds of people in this community claim to have come face to face with otherworldly phenomena. But why is it happening? If you watched Out There last season, you're familiar with the bizarre alien reports coming from River Hill. Well, tonight, Out There is proud to present all the evidence in a -a once-in-a-lifetime television event. This is Out There's Alien Exposé. Like Fox. And there's a disclaimer ahead of the show with viewer discretion is advised. This, it's called like, their special is called Alien Exposé. But this is 100% alien autopsy from yes. Fox in the 90s. I, you said it earlier, but I'm like, yep, yep. This was this was the alien autopsy, folks. Was this special on Fox? I don't care if you were thought it was bullshit. I think everybody tuned into it or was aware it was going to be on TV. Yeah. Um, the whole thing of it was this little probably fake was fake probably it was fake video of some like black and white people doing surgery on an alien that you couldn't see and then they sold it on VHS too like if you really wanted this truth to be out there would that be like would you make people buy it <laughs> that's right um but yeah so this kind of stuff like the alien stuff was very much being sold in like books 
Uh, I mentioned Fire in the Sky, the movie. Um, this special, there was more than just Alien Ops because Alien Ops t- yeah. spawned lots of more things. But Fox was the network that wasn't afraid to air something like this. Yeah, uh, Dan Aykroyd hosted the show, The X Factor. Was that mm-hmm. it? And then the like Psychic Files and what? There are a whole mm-hmm. lot of these things, and and X Files. Oh didn't yeah, yeah. Hurt that this cottage industry of this kind of stuff because the implication that there's a broader conspiracy and whatnot. And yeah, X-Files that's true. And it was on Fox. Fueled it. Yeah. I was surprised we didn't get a promo for something in this during the commercials. That was X files. Right. I was right. stunned. That's the one, uh, like, I guess I'll applaud the restraint there. Um, yeah. Maybe they thought it was too on the nose. But her. yeah, this was so such an, and it was exactly like, even the when they're like we'll be back after these messages where they have the screen with the logo and it plays the music and it floats off i'm like this is like it actually existed back then like it is insane yeah how right it is like i feel like i am what 19 i feel like i'm 14 again watching this this thing yeah and a broader note about um ivy sparks real quick as you mentioned Mm -hmm. her transition um from her her whole manner is very different. Like in the talk show when she's in the Halloween costume, mm-hmm. and she's a little more fun and whatnot. And she's very news anchor stiff in mm-hmm. the, this transition. I find it kind of an interesting way that she plays the character into, but it's accurate. It's accurate to the mm-hmm. the a complete sobriety of these specials. Like we're gonna show you some shit. <laughs> yeah, it is a great <laughs> contrast because it's not like I, I understand she's probably unhappy about her show being canceled, but she's also probably wanting to move on. And she's also playing the way she's supposed to play here, which is drastically different than what her show was. Right. And trying to move into more serious, serious territory. But they have her at this like barn dance. Um, They go to her for like the history. <laughs> she even says that at one point. I'm at a barn dance. Yeah. <laughs> like, her, her delivery of that. <laughs> uh. And it, like she gives the and she gives the lowdown the history of aliens. What do you think about this Tate Dawson guy who's the host of out there? I I don't know. He's no Frank. No, he's uh, no Frank. Is he supposed to be like because now we have two. We have and I feel like maybe Ivy's the Frank of this one. And we yeah. but it feels like it feels like Tate Dawson because he's the main guy of out there. He's you know, we were hinted to the special of his, but Maybe it is Ivy who's supposed to be our Frank here, but like he's very different than Frank Stewart, and we don't have a Frank Stewart, so why not two of them instead? Yeah. I don't know. Cause he, you talk to he, anybody, Frank is one hundred percent almost what he's what makes WNUF what it is almost. He's the glue. Yeah, he's the glue. And and Tate is he just seems skittish, and. Mm-hmm. I can't help but feel in retrospect as if some of that is deliberately bad acting given the twist that comes up later. He knows the twist is coming. Yeah. And I'm like, is this guy, is the performance the overselling of it by being nervous and he's just not a very good actor so it comes off as it's a really weird presentation style or what you know i'm thinking too much about it because right because he doesn't seem like a very pro anchor in a lot of ways it's it's just weird it's it's he he's he's discordant to me i don't know exactly how to yeah it's an interesting choice he goes for here um he's got he's kind of got the vibe of your um presenter presenter like in a uh, it's kind of it's not it's not quite uh jonathan frakes believe it or not but it's in that wheelhouse yeah where it's kind of like i'm here but i'm i'm a little bit back from you guys Do you, uh i don't know without ivy sparks if this works as well with just him the whole time yeah i don't think it would yeah it's yeah it's a really like it's it's right and it's also weird at the same time. But like you said, he knows something the rest of us don't, and it's kind of odd. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that he has to sell it, but he's not in front of the public people or the cult having to sell it. That's kind of right. so he's just selling the TV audience on it. But 
Yeah. Uh, it is the High Pike Farm that they're at, by the way. That was a mentioned in an advertisement in WNUF. Uh-huh. Um, High Pike Farms, um, which they have the um, person who owns it or the there. And uh, they do over a story about the pumpkins apparently have been probed. Probed. <laughs> And the, the woman is also like, will you say be nice? And she's like, nope, that's my old show. That's my old show. Stuff that happens when it's live. Um, but so, yeah, we're, we're kind of getting the, like the soft background of all this before it gets hardcore. Um, playing into the live, there's actual people around here aspect. And in between, so when they go to commercial breaks on this, they have sci-fi trivia with cult actor Reed Richmond. Reed he Richmond. goes... That's a true fact. And he's an old guy. Um, he played one of the, there was a commercial for a horror host towards the end of the original WNUF and with the drawn on mustache. And he's yeah. that, that guy. Um, but he gives these like weird, it starts like normal. Cause he talks about um, it's the time, it's the time machine. And then it starts going off into like random made up stuff. Um, but that's, that's a true fact. And it's got this like fake background that he's standing in and i can remember things that they would do that with like cult actor you know like oh this guy's down and out (laughs) this is the gig he could land um so there's another background thing about this uh nearby military base called mccleary air force base where conspiracy conspiracy theorists on the world wide web (laughs) have called it the bromley project and it yeah. could be the biggest scandal in the history of civilization. It's called Bromley because there's a guy who posts in a chat room that calls himself Bromley and Bromley. says he was like fired from there and is okay. divulging secret secrets. Maybe this is getting ahead of it, but I got to ask when they go to the guy and his face is blacked out. Yes. Is it not the same actor that's standing outside with Tate in the sweater? The gentleman that's given the breakdown of oh man what's going on because i totally took it as it's the same dude because he's got the same kind of ugly sweater he's got the same kind of build and only his head that's hilarious scared. oh i hope it is because that that's how i read it like it's that that's that guy and because he, he turns to me at one point and he's like you think that's true and he goes yeah like this really yeah. oh like, oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Which which is not in line with the rest of his delivery and stuff. It's like because it was me, idiot. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I took it like that, but oh, so so you know who was visited by aliens, Troy? Doctor Stanley Allen, the dentist. The dentist. So this spins crazy to where I wasn't expecting this movie to go. So he was visited by aliens. Frank Stewart from the original film turned it into a story, into a segment, which garnered a lot of call-ins with experiences about aliens. And he was going to make an alien Halloween special. Then men in black, who this is about threatened to stop it, that threatened them that they needed to stop it. And then Frank said, I was going to, he's going to push on then mysterious. uh, There's a mysterious break in at the WN studio. Uh, and all the tapes that were evidence were stolen, forcing them to can the special because they had instead, nothing. But instead, Frank Stewart tweaked the Halloween special to Ghost because he had already booked the burgers to come for the alien thing. Um, and then we get a recap of the the first movie, and they are missing. And the producer of that show uh, from WNUF thinks he was murdered by the Men in Black. An extensive search, though, came up with nothing. And the show pushes that he might have been abducted by aliens, Frank Stewart. So yeah. here we are. We are truly sequelized with we have found what we what I like is we don't find out more. We see how the public has reacted to what happened Yeah, to the WNUF Halloween special, which is very interesting. And, and I, they're going to push that alien angle because that's yes. what they're pushing. That's the that's the show they've got. They're mm-hmm. gonna, you know, if the show had been werewolves, they would have pushed werewolves, but right? Yeah, yeah, aliens because they've got aliens. And... Yeah, which is such a crazy thing. Like, I I love it because that's oh, well, well, it might be 
you know, might be the aliens. Um, we hear more stories like a pizza guy has this alien story where he got fired because he left the pizza and, and he's like, I had to pay for the pizza and the breadsticks. Because he, <laughs> he saw this alien. They do these reenactments with a guy in a suit and we get this wedding quip. That's actually pretty creepy because of the way they pan the camera yeah. around. It's very signs like. Um, I didn't quite stop there. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I like, yeah, the Frank Stewart story, these, these firsthand accounts. Um, very invested, yeah, once we get the Frank Stewart thing, because it's now like, hey, we might get some answers or or something on this. It's kind of it's it's oddly being incorporated into this national television special because the first one was a local special. Now we're at a national level. Right. Um, and this paranormal interruption comes like <sighs> loud sound. The lights go and we see this being kind of in there. Uh, but then they cut to Reed Richmond, uh, star of One Nine Hundred Frankenstein and Where Unicorns Two Blood Rainbow, for some. True facts. That's a true fact. The true <laughs> facts. Uh, so they, they call it an unusual foreign frequency. Experts are reviewing the footage of it. The experts are on hand reviewing the footage of it. Um, and then we get a cult we are introduced to with the aliens, all dressed like Dragon Ball Z. Is that what they're? A little bit. They look like they look like Dragon Ball guys to me with the orange and blue. Yeah. But, uh... Uh, the Temple of Divine Purity with a guy named Sheldon who calls himself Ding because that's what like the alien who visited him talked to it and uh, gives him visions of the ed- end times and the forefathers that will transport them to a new sphere uh, on October 31st, 1996. It's where their savior will arrive in the town of River Hall. He makes prediction uh, of it arriving that night at 955 and tells Ivy to be nice. She's talking about stuff, but so there's this cult. This is like the uh, what, like what was the uh, hail bop, hail bop comet? Yep, uh, these people had this crazy dude with white hair that led them to believe they were gonna. There's the Haley's comet work was gonna come by and they were gonna all pass away and get in behind it. And they all drank punch and wore what Nikes, yeah, they were the Heaven's Gate cult, yes, and um, god, what was the guy's name? The uh. They, uh, Marshall Applewhite was the mm. guy's name, but he went by yep. something else. Um, de- as do okay, D O and ding do, do yeah. And so, but they they thought that when you know the comet came by, that they were going to ascend to join the uh, the beings communicating with them from the comet. But there was a drastic step they had to take in order to do so. <laughs> yeah. Uh and yeah, these these another so in WNUF there was a cult. Kind of it was a religious kind of cult. Yeah. Just evil. Um, and then we have these these people. Um the cult of the the alien. People will form around any any kind of being. Um and they're kind of Slightly creepy, but not as creepy as they could have been. Maybe. Yeah, they they seem weirdly innocent. I mean, yeah. to to fall on the H. Uh, G. Wells Morlock reference, they have like an Eloy quality about them. They're just like super naive. They're the kind of people that you might expect think that benevolent aliens are going to take them away. Right. Right. Uh, and then, uh, the lights go out where they're at, and he's like, "They're coming, Miss Sparks," and I can't wait to see your face when they arrive. So. They've, they've got that. Um, there's the analysis of the rogue transmission with uh, Tate and his research experts. And an off- author and UFOologist, Derek McBride, says it's not good. It's a declaration of war. It's coming yeah. from four miles above the Air Force Base. So they uh, that this follows with the Bromley confessional we talked about with the hidden face and distorted voice. Yeah. Um, he talks about a refrigerator of diseases not found on this planet. Uh, that are being stored there, uh, surgeries on alien cadavers, and in the fall of '94, like fear of alien messages leaking to the American public, um, had a military takeover. Said so the science didn't matter anymore; it was military takeover. Um, and it's just kind of building up to what could be in this military base because they they're planning this 
invasion of it or sneaking in and they've got like cameras cameras they've they've hidden cameras in there and stuff and uh the the cult guy continues to egg on ivy sparks being like miss sparks you're gonna feel very silly when the mothership arrives talking about things and um so they do the mission mcclearly air force mission um and she's like i'm excited or i'm excited as i am terrified i believe that was tate um it may cost us our jobs but it may save our lives and so they have six different cameras plus a crew sneaking in remotely operated and ivy narrates the whole thing cameras are getting found uh, and they get churned off except one gets in and it finds an alien autopsy which is this is unprecedented they kept saying unprecedented unprecedented um and yeah like and so there's that oh we we found this this is oh this is incredible um and then at 9:55 something blasts by Tate um and then we have footage of an alien coming out of the crash wreckage and it walks towards the camera and there's a broadcast interruption again and then a light from above the cult from above comes on and the cult starts they get these drinks out and they start drinking it and the alien approaches and it's Reed Richmond. Reed he Richmond. says, Happy Halloween, folks. It's me, cult movie star Reed Richmond. And then all the cult members are like, why would you do this? And they start puking and puking and going nuts. And then they, they call the they end the show. Um, but so that yeah, that's the uh, out there special. Which um yeah, it, it played perfectly like one of until the end got really, you know, like WN got F got dark got to like yeah. like a movie but um it played like one of those things where they bullshit 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 build fear build fear build fear and then here's the little three seconds you tuned in for yeah and you know obviously the autopsy's crap but the, you know one of the great things is ivy spark standing there is the people are dying around her and just like not having any idea what to do just kind of like mm-hmm. looking she ends up kind of like looking sort of at the camera in like insane fear realizing yeah that like i just stood here all these people died yeah and you know it was but the the, the whole shenanigans <laughs> of it that fake out thing it was also mm-hmm. the same shit as the talk shows the same yeah. ambush kind of thing we're going to get you to believe aliens but no they're not you know and... mm-hmm. yeah uh and yeah that's kind of like their their gotcha thing on the cult members we're gonna make these people look real stupid on tv right um and then yeah the all for the oh, i am and you kind of knew like the reed richmond stuff going on throughout i was kind of like there's going to be something with him. Like, it's kind of weird. And then I, I laugh when he pulled out. I was like, okay, that's a good, that's a good punchline to that. Have yeah. There. I kind of wondered if the help op thing was coming in because when they were doing this stuff with the cult, I started thinking how the first one took the dark turn toward the end of the show. Yeah. And I thought, are, are these people just going to like kill themselves or everyone else? Right. Or, they're the you know representatives i guess of, yes yeah like, that's what i was thinking too i was like we're gonna get to punch is that is that gonna happen but it felt weird because i'm like they all did that in a in like a a, a complex right yeah it was they a compound prep. yeah and um let's see 39 people at a house in Rancho Santa Fe in San Diego. They gotcha. coordinated a series of ritual suicides. Mm. Do you remember which is nuts. So, so they they all wore specific clothes and I remember one like I think the shoes were Nike's or something like that. Yeah, I think work. that's right. And was it Mad TV? that did like a Nike commercial using that footage <laughs> of like the news footage of them going through the bunk beds and being like, Nike, just do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they like made a parody commercial based on that. Like, wow. 
I, yeah. I think I think it might have been Mad TV. I, I'm not sure, but someone made a parody. Um, yeah, crazy. but it was it was definitely Nike. Nike decades. Oh, Nike decades. Okay. Oh boy, yeah. So, but, um, what? But yeah, that was okay. that was just a. It, it's one of those things that certainly plays better as a plot element if you remember that. If you don't have an awareness of it, you're probably mm-hmm. maybe a little at sea on that one. But right. But, um. So we we have commercials during the special to go through. Um. So Governor Bob Dandridge is back. He he must have yes. won, and he's now running for Senate to drain the IRS. Yep. And uh, but his competitor says that he is bad for our state, bad for our country, and it is less like <clears throat> he's every GOP Republican. So like the stuff he's against, yeah. the stuff he says. Um, he's running against Congresswoman Kirsten Rice, who says, "That's right, Louie." It's time we send Robert Dandridge a message by sending me to the United States Senate. Like there's one where it was like talking about the city. It was like, this is where you fell in love. This is where you live. This is the this. And this is booth is where you'll vote on Tuesday. Yeah. So, I thought that was funny. That's uh, great. But yeah, Dandridge has a couple ads. She's got a couple ads. So he's once again in the thick of it. Um, The political race. I really like her ad on him where instead of having like a bunch of stuff that makes him look, there's just this one picture of him with like this really stupid expression on his face. It's just the yes. still, you know, oh. in the corner making oh. him look really dumb. Yes. Uh, we have uh, Slim Fryers. It's a chicken place that has a reusable cup when that's filled and they call it, it's a Halloween, a skeleton comes out and goes, bone a petite. It's like, ha ha. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's like some, I think it's like a shoe company or something. It's like Achilles. It says, outrun your dreams. Yeah. Oh, um, RB Harkers. It's a, like a Six Flags ish place doing Halloween stuff for Halloween. Um, here's a specific one 1 800 dial any. It's a collect call service and they've got like a mob guy with a bat talking about it. Yeah. That one made me laugh out loud because talk about something that just has disappeared from the world. Yeah. The kids don't know. Yeah. Stuff. It's that just, it's almost not even worth discussing because it's so arcane. There were so many numbers like 1-800 yeah. call ATT, right? That was one of yeah. them. Yeah. 1-800 collect. Collect was one of them. And basically like, I mean, for kids to know, like if you didn't have money at a payphone to make a call, you called one of these numbers and it would charge the recipient of the call. Uh, and we would use this at school. So if I had like practice or something and my parents needed me to pick, pick up what the collect call would do was it would, it would first, it would, there'd be a, they'd ask you to record your name at the tone. And when the, it would call the person you were calling It'd be like, you have a collect call from it'd be like Brandon. Or it'd be my recording, Brandon. And it, and it's like, do you accept Will you the charges? Accept the charges? Will you accept the charges? <laughs> and so you'd say yes. So what we would do is in my school, we had pay phones. So I'd take a pay phone, call collect, dial the number I'm supposed to, I want to call. And they'd be like, record your name after this. I'd be like, Brandon can pick me I up. Out of practice. <laughs> Out of practice, pick me up. Brandon can pick me up. Um, but they wanted to like it would know if you said a sentence and not a name or something like that. So you'd have like Brandon could pick me up, and so it'd be like you have a collect call from Brandon could pick me up, and they'd be like uh, they have not accepted the charges. Goodbye, and so I know my parents got it. They were coming to yep. pick me up, and nobody was getting charged for that phone call. Yep, and it could. I mean, those calls. It was like uh, how much it was like a buck twenty five just to pick up, yeah. and then after every minute it was. Like fifty cents or twenty five. Yeah, cents? I was gonna say fifty cents, but the, the probably the greatest commentary on on how we had to communicate in the eighties and early nineties is in Hot Tub Time Machine, when mm-hmm. um the the nephew whose name eludes me at the moment is talking to the girl. He's trying to make plans with her, 
and he's like how do, do i call you or text you or something she's like no you just come find me and he says that sounds exhausting yes and but that that was some true shit that was you know yeah. if you missed somebody at a place you missed them you had to yeah look or wait or recreate your steps or you yeah. know the, the the i i have a fairly clear memory of when things transitioned to where I never had a phone to, I always had a phone. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and in like, I mean, you can't, you couldn't just tell someone running late, heavy traffic. You were just pissing that person off because you didn't show up yet. Yeah. Like, and you were innocent of not something happening. And yeah. How many dates went bad, started off bad? How many, because this communication wasn't there. Um, yeah, it's insane. Uh, but there were commercials for these things all over the place, and that way uh-huh. they nailed it. Um, Endless. Uh, wasn't there an internet like an AOL? Yes, type USA Connected too? Online. Yeah, there was that one. Yep, that was a that was a thing, and they had good graphics and stuff for that that nailed it. Uh, yeah. I, I I loved Harold's toilet paper. <laughs> it was the mummy on the toilet paper, and he looks up. And he's got like one hanging because he's out and he looks over. He's like, oh, and it, it was just good comedy right yeah. there. Uh, there was your extreme drinks, Troy. We had Zygot, your secret weapon against thirst. Yeah, that, that's hard to explain because there there are a, a, quite a few energy drinks and stuff on the market now. But that was the birth of that. Yep, that was the the advent of. You know, Mountain Dew Extreme and mm-hmm. everything that was like that. Yeah, I'm also <laughs> wondering if I'm being, like, it's funny. So I got, back in 2012, I stopped drinking soda. I was, I was like, hooked on Diet Coke and stuff. And then I was looking for things uh, to drink that would kind of fit. I drink, like, fruit juices a lot. And then I got a one of those like soda stream things yeah and i make my own and i just it tastes syrupy and stuff and then in the store there was like a couple coming out there was um the ice brand with the top and then i got those and i like those and then those like took off huge and then uh I was doing it like I just still drink energy drinks though, but I needed I just stopped drinking those. And then all of a sudden, around the time we did that, there was caffeinated ice brands, so they add caffeine to it. Now, and there's also ones now that they actually put fruit juice in them, the sparkling, um, spindrift and stuff. And I'm like, I started someone like, I think they're like evolving me slowly into getting back into soda again somehow. <laughs> but you know, like I feel like they're there's and then all of a sudden I'm drinking soda because there's ones that are now flavored like cherry Coke and yeah. stuff like that. I'm like, wait a minute. And there's like lemon lime. I'm like, I think they're like trying to like, like drag me back to just, think, yeah. well, I just might as well be drinking this stuff anyway. That's right. It's funny. Just like, yeah. Like you say, the jolt goes into becoming, you know, Red Bull. The, Cause there used to be just like what Red Bull and then yeah. there was Rockstar. And now there's just like, you know, Monster people are branding and... energy drinks. It's like, oh yeah, you got the Best Buy jacked energy drink. You know, like what? Buy Best yeah. Buy is an energy drink. Um, it's the insanity of quenching our thirst and keeping awake. Um, so we also have uh Corbin's toothpaste, which is just like a vampire selling toothpaste. It's not yeah, really. It's, it's totally the Colgate package. It's yeah. A... Yeah, nothing extreme. Uh, Phil's Carpet Warehouse. So he is. Push it, leading. Off. If I'm on trial for great deals, then I am guilty as charged. And he's like just playing into his yep. uh, money laundering court case there, um, wearing the stereotypical prison outfit with the stripes. And so. right, uh, there is a Rasso's Pizza commercial that if that would have been a pizza commercial in my local town, I don't care if their pizza tasted like shit. I would eat there all the time. It was zombies coming in and stealing pizza. Yes. It's just awesome. And it's like it's a no brainer. Like that, that um that door shot is 100 the uh 
uh, zombies entering the elevator from Dawn of the Dead. Oh they, yeah, they have, yeah. Like, the same framing on it and everything. It's just. Oh yeah, it's perfect. Um, uh, there's also Veronica Stanzi. She's selling sooner or lather. It's a yep. bubble bath thing. Um, and you can win tickets to her show buying it. And she is a completely different person than we saw her the last time. Like she, you can tell success has hit her. Um, yeah. There, um, we get a bumper for a show called Confirm or Deny, which we'll talk about in just a second here. Um, it has stories of like a hot dog murderer and the potential Y2K crisis. You remember the Y2K crisis, Troy? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm, I, a, uh, I'm a survivor. Yeah, I wrote about that in uh, Canceling the Apocalypse, an article about oh. predictions for the end of the world and stuff. And uh, But yeah, that, that's another one. Kids, do you know the Y2K crisis? This this is basically uh, why you don't cut corners at work. Um, <laughs> for lack of, for lack of a better word, all the programming that was done at a certain point was done with the presumption that you should use two digits for the years. And so, yeah, when the calendar would flip from ninety nine to two thousand, the end digits would be zero zero. And then some programmers realized, oh, that's bad because. We didn't account if the flip might reset systems by going back to zero zero instead of becoming two thousand. So we need mm-hmm. to go back on every system on the planet and make it four four digits for the years so it doesn't mm-hmm. do that. Ultimately, very few things happened. There was like a, a one neighborhood somewhere lost power because the thing. I mean, these are like the documented ones. You had yeah. like about four square city blocks losing power. He had a couple of individual businesses. Stuff went offline, but then came back when they reset it. But there, the prediction was that airplanes would fall out of the sky. And right? All yeah, this yeah, and yeah. Stuff. And you know, none of it happened. There was no collapse of civilization. There's that probably some cult of years. it. There's <laughs> probably some cult that was like, "We're ready for it." The Y two K. Then it didn't happen. But um... yeah. We get uh, Main Man, so it strengthens and rejuvenates thinning hair. The Real Man's cue, Cure for Thinning Hair. Uh, Zarin's Barbecue Ranch Waffle Chips, Dastardly Delicious. Uh, oh, and there's La-, La Galosa, the how-to video for a dance that's obviously the Macarena. Yep. From that time. Uh, oh, this is a good one. Gargasaur. It was this movie that yes. was starring some like baseball player and like a model or something. Yep, that was funny. A great, great uh, video effects of the superimposed Godzilla ripoff staying between the buildings. That was right. that was uh, fun. That was a good one. I loved it. Um, oh, another uh, rocket, an extreme soda. Whether you surf it, skate it, or slam it. Pick up a 12 pack because pure adrenaline only lasts so long. That's right. Oh, gosh. Rocket. Uh, the, then uh, there's a perfume called Bouquet by Heaven Scent. Yeah, which, which is a B O U apostrophe Q U E T. But the vibe of that was very much like those uh, Calvin Klein and Dior. Ads yes, that you know Natalie Partman and Shirley's there and do. And you gotta be impressed because they are like, they're not shooting some of this too. They're taking stuff intended for something else and making it completely vibe and fit with, yeah, other things, which is incredible. I mean, like these are not only the writing, um, and executing wise, but like they're editing masterpieces too. These yeah. WNUF and the and this out there, um. Speaking of out there, season three commercial, we get that. That, well, probably not happening. Probably not happening. <laughs> uh, Nail Biters, the Goosebumps book series. Yes. It's like just like Goosebumps. And then um, Forest Fire, it's a trailer for Gabrielle Creek, which Michael Bay, Gabrielle Creek. Yeah. Michael Bay, Gabrielle Creek. Uh, Gag City, uh, your Halloween headquarters another one uh essential vibes compilation cd that was tremendous that was good that, was, that the the compilations you know sadly we've also lost the infomercials for the time life series of uh cds yeah. over time 
Yeah. I used to like the 50s, Time of Life, 50s and 60s, or Time of Life, easy listening, Time of Life, the love collection. The love collection. You know, I, I actually, the last time I bought Time of Life was like, I believe it was like 2005. I bought uh, Get Smart, the entire um, series on DVD, because it was only nice. available through Time of Life at that time. Um, but yeah, I, I went for one of those things, but. Yeah, Time Life, there's all sorts of stuff. They have their own market on things like CDs and uh, book, like, uh, when, when called like books, uh, they were like research book type article yeah. things. Yeah. Focus. Uh, there was a video game commercial. That's new. Uh, Noble Quest 4. Yeah. Video game. It, the, they also ran down the villains you had defeated in one through three. Right. Like, now he's <laughs> Sir Wilford. Like there was, uh, like there was commercials like that where they shot live action people doing, and I love that. Like I, I geek out. Like I loved, um, like the first Resident Evil game because they actually shot people. Like it was, it was live action cut scenes mixed with the game. Yeah, um, granted, it was the opening and the closing, but I thought that I always thought that was neat with live action stuff, and I got sucked into the. Uh, do you remember that era? There's nothing of that on this, but it's reminding me where there were like CD-ROM games that were like interactive movies, like the Wing Commander. Oh yeah, Wing Commander three, three, and uh, the Heart uh, of the Tiger. Yeah, that hired uh, porn star to be in it. Uh, Ginger, was it Ginger Allen. Allen. Yep, she was in it with starred with Mark Hamill Mark and Hamill. David Warner. I think was David Warner in that. Yeah, was he David in the movie? Warner was in it. John yeah. Reese Davies was in it. John Reese Davies. Yeah, um, remember that movie. Or that one, and then there was um, the De Dallas Encounter with Tia Carrera. Yes, that one was uh, that one. Uh, the Seventh Guest and Eleventh Hour, loved those. Like the Eleventh Hour, legit shot some good stuff for that. Um, and then what was it? They did with Star Wars. Uh, there was um Rebel Assault Two, shot yeah new yeah. stuff yeah. So those were that was a thing. I like I lived for that. I thought that was the coolest thing. And then they were like, you know what? We just we're not gonna pay. Act. We just CG do voice. Yeah. All right. So yeah. Uh, uh. Speaking of a a fad that was here, take home twisters. This isn't a movie. This is real life. And get a mini Twitter Twister Twister flashlight with their order. Like people, the VHS era was still in some sort of discovery here, where they were just throwing shit on there and see if people would buy it. Because this is like, yeah, just video of of tornadoes. That's it. You want to watch tornadoes? We'll sell it to you for probably an ungodly price, which would later end up in being like bum fights and those type of things. But they would just put stuff on there and people buy it. They buy it. Yep. <clears throat> Uh, we have Nomad, a new TV show coming to Aces November, which looks just like Renegade. Renegade, yep. And uh, let's see, uh, Mullins Light. It's, <laughs> That's a great commercial. Yeah, the classic the... monster, uh, mad scientist commercial. And he's there's a hunchback guy, and he's like, oh, this is something about the beard. He goes, oh, I've got a hunch too. Yeah, he, he says, uh, or, I've got a hunch. People are gonna love it. And he's like, I've got another hunch. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, it was good. Uh, and then lastly, we have um, Disturbance Call, which joined Tampa's finest from drunk drivers to pushy prostitutes, which is obviously cops. Yeah. Which was on Fox all the time. But, Hold on location with the men and women of law enforcement. Uh, so that's it for the commercials. We go to Confirm or Deny, the show that had a commercial up in here. Uh, we find out the cult group all died. Of a mass suicide, uh, Ivy, uh, she has and Tate. They're being questioned about w- what they staged and could they could stand trial for conspiracy and manslaughter. Yeah, that's a uh, would. Uh, I just have to. I like that's crazy, but I'm like I have to wonder. Like, would uh, would they really get pushed for that? I mean. It's crazy. Hey, I feel like a TV thing would, would get away with it. There wouldn't be any real trial or anything like that. I don't know. Yeah, I. it's a good question. Um, I, I'm really not sure how far it would go. Now, the, um, 
I did look up the the Jenny Jones bit that mm-hmm. I mentioned. Yeah. And um, this is related to that. Okay. Um, Scott Amador was um, during a Jenny Jones episode. He revealed he was attracted to uh, Jonathan Schmitz, who was an acquaintance. Three days later, Schmitz confronted Amador and shot him twice in the chest. He confessed the killing and was found guilty of second degree murder. The family successfully sued the Jenny Jones show for wrongful death. Uh, the judgment was sub- subsequently overturned by the Michigan Court of Appeals. Um, because of how f- quickly everything happened, the episode was never aired in part of the regular rotation. Okay. And then in 1999 was the trial um, that the jury found the show was both irresponsible and negligent, continuing the show intentionally created an unpredictable situation with that due concern for possible consequences. And then it was overturned, and the Michigan Supreme Court declined to hear it. But I think that pretty much um, killed her show. Mm, okay. I think that that was well. It actually ran for a few more years. Oh. Let's see, my memory was sketchy on that. It ran till '03. All of that, and the trial was '99. So it did lumber on. Probably for drastically a bit. different and safer. Yeah, so obviously elements of that are, you know, in play. Mm-hmm. They 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 would have known all of that. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Um, but the uh, yeah, out there show got canceled. We find with that too. Uh, and coming up, they have a visit to the set of Forest Fire. But then we go to the com- the news bumper for what's coming up on the news. And they say the demolition of Meadow Ridge Baptist Church, an earth skeletal remains dating back to the 1980s. New forensic technology is being put to use to identify the remains. And that, folks, is a killer fucking ending yep. to this thing. It, it is the payoff. It is a giant payoff to the first film to this. Like, that is incredible. So they buried them under the church. From the last one. That is, oh, it's so crazy. Like, I, that was something I wasn't expecting. The touches are nice. And then that little revelation at the end is incredible. Bo, I mean, that just ties it off beautifully. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and oh. it, it, it's interesting to me, too, because it raises all kinds of logistical questions. Because obviously, at the first movie, you see the people with the axe. Mm-hmm. And you see the people, the crazy people are the people who are protesting earlier in the first movie. There's yes. like a clear line drawn to this church, to the protests, to the attack. So somehow they got the bodies out of the place. Yeah. Well, they <laughs> cut, they, they, we see like the people dead and then they cut off Frank's tongue on film, which yeah, that, that tape we have may not be one seen to the public, but. Yeah. So, yeah, then. Hey, yeah, they got him out of there. The police were slow to respond, or because at a certain point, there's like the implication that the tape belongs to who did it. In the first right. one, where it's it's like they've recorded this stuff, and yeah, you know, right. So... Almost like a weird variation on VHS, but you know, yes, yes, true, true. Um, but real, uh, yeah. So, uh, overall thoughts on out there as the as itself in a sequel to WNUF. Well, it's, it's interesting because I think that it inextricably um, tied to the first one. I mean, mm-hmm. it is the extension and payoff of the first one with everything. Like yes. the um, commercials are great. Lots of great commercial stuff. Lots of great bits. Um, I really like the talk show recreation. As I said, I found a lot of familiarity in that. Um, the uh, whole um, show, I I thought it was funny that it, it was like they had to, when they did the bit with Reed Richmond being revealed as the alien. Mm-hmm. You knew some gut punch had to come after that because they wouldn't have done something that goofy with the right like, arc of the whole movie. I like it probably slightly less than the first one but that's because mm-hmm. the first one was so new and unique but right, as yeah, the extension, yep. 
this does a great job because they also use it to fill in gaps and answer questions about the first one so that it becomes a thing that fits together yes in a way that you really can't separate them you know it's mm-hmm. not like we've been having the discussion in my house uh for a week now about like okay which version of which halloween is better than which version of which you know the the, the four continuities right? yeah yeah you know and and i keep coming back to the the two things which is like man there's nothing wrong with the original halloween too nope, and there wasn't. also season of the witch fucking rules <laughs> and i keep yeah. coming back to, to that so it's like you know nothing wrong with one two three and uh but at the same thing here, it's like th- there's nothing wrong with with two, but it works so much better with the two things as a unit. Yes, you know, as that's kind of my yeah, overall. It's, it's refreshingly, while doing the same thing, very different than the first one. Yeah, I quite frankly can't imagine how a two thousands one would work. Yeah, that's where the next step would be if they went for a three they'd probably bump up a decade but i don't know would they like would it be like i don't i i really don't know would it have to be some have to be a reality show reality ghost show based or something which we've seen yeah. that we, we've seen that kind of stuff already yeah uh, so or they just trust these people to do it way way better um because, yeah, you have, like, coming up in the 2000s, you have, like, MTV Sphere. You have uh, the, the rise of the ghost shows. But is that the tens is more of the ghost shows? I don't know. I think it's, I think like it's the, the zeros, like ghost hunters zeros. and stuff. You have, like, but, forensic files, I guess. Yeah. 99. I mean, Blair Witch Project is 99. So, right. like, anything after that is kind of, we're just doing Blair Witch Project. Right. Yeah, you got that. I mean, yeah, I'm just trying to think of what was on television. Yeah. To a bigger audience that would have fit there. I mean, you got, yeah, you, the reality stuff around then. You got, like, like I said, fear, jackass, uh, horror, big brother, yeah, big brother, survivor. Um, big, yeah. I was going to say, the like, mole, almost a big, my favorite almost, one, the mole. Almost a, uh, like a murder in a big brother house, but bodies, bodies, bodies kind of did that a little bit. A little bit, the, yeah. Yeah. That one, yeah. Social media murder. Yeah. That's what, yeah, I kind of did that. But, hmm. Cause there's a, there's a brilliant film from the era uh, that tackles reality TV stuff and murder. It's called Series Seven. Did you ever see that? Oh, one? Yeah. 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 Oh, so brilliant. I need to talk about it on this show because it's one of my favorite movies and that one's just still holds up today. Um, just and that I one doesn't seen it in forever. That's like oh three, right? Ish. Yeah, I think it was two thousand because I saw it. I think the summer before I moved to uh months to go to Ball State. I think it was two thousand one. Okay, is when it came two thousand one or two thousand two, something like that was when it came out. Um, it came around the I same time. It used to be okay. This is how dorky I am. The DVD for Traffic had the trailer for it all over it. Oh, okay. Because it was at USA Films. Um, so yeah, that's that's where it was. But yeah, that series seven tackled that really well. Um, feeling genuine, playing sincere, and then third act takes a turn. But um, yeah, I can't. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of what what were the, what was like a special on TV at the time that would have. Because that's where these have focused. They've been like yeah. special events, and I can't think of events. I granted, I probably wasn't watching. I was in college a lot of it. You know, they really like... stopped doing them the same way after the nineties. Like the eighties mm-hmm. had Geraldo and the Vault, and then you know, yeah, the Alien Autopsy, and then I can't think of equivalents for those. Yeah, I can't. I can't. Like it be a news package thing, but yeah. So. It would have to be like a top-down reinvention, or maybe he'll just make other stuff. I know that this guy's directed things like, yeah. you know, Call Girl of Cthulhu and right, whatnot. Yeah, he's but, done a lot of indie indie horror stuff. So it's like, yeah, these are kind of been like a a fun project for him to like. Maybe this is his well that he goes back to for things. But um, these to me, these look like a lot of work. I know people. 
probably yeah. realize it, but they uh, just to me it just seems like piles and piles. And granted, COVID probably helped this movie along because he could sit at home and edit together these commercials and do all this stuff. Um, yeah, but it's yeah, these just to me like I watch them. I'm just like masterful like editing and you know these are never going to win awards or anything like that like they should like because it just seems so tough like it'd be so tough to edit for me and, and they're so specific mm-hmm. they're so specific and I, I can't imagine people outside the age group right like really enjoying them in the way that's going to make you revisit it Right. And well, the thing, well, you know, it's funny because I had Jessica and I, I would have, I, I specifically was interested in her last week at WNUF. She enjoyed it, but she had like no attachment or recollection. She, she grew up, she was born in like 87. So she had no, it wasn't like as, so I gave her this one too to watch because I'm like, yeah. I bet, I bet you're going to recognize this one though. Um, yeah. She, she enjoyed it, thought it was fun, but she didn't, she wasn't like, she didn't get the direct connection to it. Yeah. Which I, I want to show my kids sometime this, like be like, hey, you want to see what TV really look like? <laughs> this isn't real, but man, is it close. This will give you a good hour and a half recap of what things could be like. Yes. This is like the, the fictional historical version. Of, this is the biopic of 80s local television. <laughs> well, yeah, and it, it had to, uh, you know, uh, not only the editing, but just the uh the assembly the yeah. how do you put this in order in a way that delivers this and how does it how do you how do you do an assembly cut of this that hits the high notes that you want it to hit when you want it to hit right because that reveal of the church basement etc the, the stinger of that is just fantastic yeah that that wouldn't work anywhere else in the film it's got to be after every single other thing it's got right and it's and and it's played as this uh whatever yeah so huge so huge and it's like a whatever moment like just tossed away like oh and coming up this well like what what yep whoa and you just and you it's enough for you to like it doesn't have to like beat you over the head with it it's enough that you figure out oh well they're gonna find out what happened to those bodies now it the mystery solved um but yeah i yeah it's, it's quite quite good um they're definitely complimentary um yeah the first one because the first one has frank stewart and that is in it's not like he's like oh it doesn't have frank stewart it's got its own qualities but none of its qualities are as good as that performance um, yeah that really yeah because no the burgers were good too in that one um. Yeah, the first one is just special because you don't know what to expect. You're there now. You're like you have an expectation, so you kind of know what's yeah. going to go go on here. I, I do like that. There's a theme that unites the two of them, like the artifice of television. Like yeah, the the very act of filming something yeah kind of fictionalizes it, you know. And then they've got there's an actor playing the priest in the first one. There's an actor playing the alien in the second one. Oh, you that's know, true. Yeah. 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 There, there's these kind of vibes of, of, you know, this stuff is all a put on. And I kind of curious is like where, you know, the director comes down on, you know, his, his theme is his whole thing is like, you know, this stuff is, it's all an illusion. It's you know, like, see, you know, that that's yeah. Because if you think about it in WNUF, he has the burgers who are true believers that I think he, Frank Stewart thinks are full of shit. And he brings on the actor as the priest only you know, to do the exorcism stuff, only that he's fake and be like, if these people fall for his exorcism, they're, they're full of shit. And that's my next story. Then in the second one, you have the cult believers who the, the news group brings there to show they're full of crap with the alien. The actor dressed up as the alien as a reveal too. So it's a little more on the nose here. Not like it's not like we're talking thematics here. Right, a little right. more there. But now I'm seeing it there and you saying that makes me look back at that one and go, that's what he was trying to say there, too. Because, yeah. It's oh, interesting. It, and, and, and use of the talk show works really well with that, too. Like, this is all oh, fake. Yeah. This, oh, is yeah. all, this is all stagey and 
you know, all these. Well, well like Maury and like Jerry Springer would be like, okay, they pay someone be like, okay, what do I got to say I am? Okay. And then this guy's going to come over and hit you in the face, but we're giving you like 250 bucks. Is that cool? Like that's what those kind of turned into, right? Yeah. People just selling themselves out to go be crazy like that. But yeah. So yeah, the out there Halloween mega tape, which is the WNUF sequel. Um, it's available on DVD from the distributor. Um, so just type it in DVD and you'll get sent to their big cartel website where you can order that. And the WNUF Halloween being special on DVD. I have found that the Blu-ray for that is out of print. So wow. if, you missed, if you missed it last year from Vinegar Syndrome partner label, I don't believe they actually put it, but their partner label did. Um, you have missed out until they, if they put it out again, which is WNUF uh, Halloween special is streaming on a couple of services. Yeah, of, I did. I did see it was yeah. on archive.org. So Take that one. It was on Shutter at one point. It's so on Shutter. Sure. It's been on Amazon. Um, it floats around places. So if it's not currently easy to find, it will be soon uh, at some yeah. point. But it's a very if you are if you were a child of the eighties, you you should check it out, even if you're not into horror movies. Um uh, if grew, especially if you grew up in like Midwest, because I think it speaks very Midwest. Yeah. Um definitely. in north Midwest Northeast um speaks to that uh heavily. And then of course the say sequel, I think if you're you know grew up in the nineties and stuff, you definitely recognize it too. Yep. So um but that'll uh that'll do it for another Halloween and another episode of the show. Uh Troy, as always, thank you for coming in. We're uh to thank pick you. up picking up where our WNUF Ace TV twenty eight uh, adventures left off so uh before we head out where can people keep up with you um you can find me at saturdayeveningpost.com on twitter at troy brownfield and on facebook same thing <laughs> awesome uh i'm on twitter and instagram at brand 4 kuhd written work at why so blue uh when the show returns scott Mendelson is back and we'll be releasing the first episode of tim burton's big retrospective and I've been quite frequently mentioning here, so check that out. Uh, enjoy your Halloween uh, trick or treat and stay film positive. Happy Halloween. From my Troy to yours. Thank you for listening. The Brandon Peters Show is a Creative Zombie Studios production, produced by Brad Shoemaker and Brandon Peters, written and edited by Brandon Peters. Announcer vocals by Jessica Olsman. Theme song by Metavari. Web design and show art by Brad Shoemaker with Brandon Peters. All music and clips featured in the episode are property of their respective studios and no infringement is intended. Additional information on this and other episodes at brandonpetersshow.com. For any inquiries, press opportunities, or sponsorship, contact mail at brandonpetersshow.com. show is available on Apple Music, Spotify, or anywhere podcasts are found.